One of the extraordinary facts of investigative pursuits is that uh, historical research has become a significant part of it for the first time. The uh, attempts in the last 10, 15, 20 years to revisit uh, areas which it was conveniently thought had been solved, that all questions had been answered, uh, is now open to, to serious questioning. This substratum of investigative stuff really attempts to puncture uh, illusions and fraudulent uh, interpretations of history. And I was in that wonderful institution, the Mitchell Library in Sydney, and I came across uh, there, understandably, the Australians are uh, kind of interested in convicts and transportation, and they have a vast collection on, on convicts and transportation. And I came across an astonishing book. It was very old, very obscure, and it amazed me. It, uh, it told of how women were uh, in the 18th and 17th centuries were, and children too, were shipped and sold in America. And I'd never heard of this. I'd never heard of the details. And while this, while this only told a bit of the story, it's, it disturbed me and encouraged me and horrified me. So I thought, great story here. I came back to, to England with a, the photocopy of this book and he will tell you what happened then. <laughs> well, I suppose that I am, I'm laurel to, uh, to Mike's uh, uh, Hardy in that, in that it was another fine mess he got me into, in that I, I, I read the, uh, the photocopies of what he had brought back, and what he brought back was, was photocopies of a book uh, written by a man called Abbott Emerson Smith, who had uh, written about how women, uh, mainly prostitutes, but all sorts of other people as well, who were taken out of the Bridewell prison in London in the early 1600s and sent off to the new colonies in America as brides for the planters, if you like. So these were women of marriageable age or a breeding age or whatever who would be sent off because up until then, of course, you had a brand new colony, it was all men and for this to become viable, they needed women. And this seemed to be an astonishing thing. And so it went from there and one looked at this and thought, well, this is just the tip of something. This is actually the edge of something here. And so the very fact that these women were taken out of uh, the penal system in Britain, in England, and sent off to the new colonies uh, with, uh, with uh, no, no say for themselves about whether or not they went or not. So the interesting thing was, what was it they were going into? What, what was it was already there that these people could just be taken out and shipped 3,000 miles away? And so we started to look at what this possibly could mean and what the wider context was of that. And that's how it began. And we unearthed a wider and wider story. We found it wasn't just women, it was children, it was convicts, it was prisoners of war, it was all sorts. It was so people who, who signed up uh, as indented servants to get to America free of, uh, they didn't have to pay the passage, the poor. They would be uh, contracted, indentured by uh, merchants and by um, captains and by, and by planters' agents uh, to go to America free in return for which they gave up their rights to their labour for several years. It was supposed to be, according to history, it's four or five years. In fact, it could be as many as 12. And what they didn't realise was that they were signing away all their rights and they had become chattels. They were used as property, regarded as property. Now, as we began to... Uh, investigate this and we used all this all the kind of resources that investigators do we look at every every kind of book every kind of um, official report etc diaries letters we realized it was an enormous uh, story and it was also something which which refuted one of the key uh, ideas of the development of slavery which is that in 1619 slavery began in america with the arrival of 20 and odd Negroes, as they were called, um, sold, according to uh, accounts, by a Dutch captain to planters in England. And this was where slavery began, when well, it wasn't true. Uh, slavery had begun earlier. Uh, children and women had been, and convicts had been sold earlier than that. And they, although a, a small number of Africans uh, were subsequently brought to Virginia and sold over the next decades, only very few, only 300, only very few, only 350 years later, oh sorry, 20 years later. But meantime, hundreds, thousands of uh, poor whites were being brought in and on various convicts and children, etc. And, and they were being enslaved, and they were being enslaved, and they were being enslaved.
writers of American history did not mention that Caucasians were enslaved people in America. They tend not to say that white enslaved people made up the majority of the population of enslaved people in America. Was this part of America's history purposely hidden from the public, be it school curriculums, books, movies, and other correlating resources that regurgitate this information? What could be a possibility as to why this part of history was kept away from us? Also, I have some information that I will share with you that could give us a possible answer to these questions. So now, what we are told concerning slavery in America can vary depending on the context, source, and perspective, but some key factors are generally emphasized in discussions and other various educational content about this matter. We were told that slavery in America began in the early 17th century when the first enslaved so-called Africans arrived in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619, even though I proved in my previous documentaries and also my book called It Was Told in Reverse that this information was written inaccurately and only small portions of the initial story can be validated like it initially being a system that primarily used indentured servants from various backgrounds, meaning different countries of other continents. But over time, this story's alleged victims were alleviated, suffering from racially biased propaganda. More about that in a second. One of the most highlighted and promoted stories concerning slavery in America was known as the transatlantic slave trade story which was told to us as being the most brutal and dehumanizing aspect of the institution because the tale alludes to millions of Africans being forcibly transported to the Americas as enslaved people. Still, it fails to mention specific descriptive details of how that courageous task was even possible, significantly when the British Americans' foreign population did not outnumber Africa's and the Americas' indigenous people. They would like for you to fantasize about how a small group of anonymously known white people were able to sneak up on non-specified African tribes as they were sleeping peacefully at night and then randomly captured their people and swiftly rushed them all back to their sailboats in loud metal chains without any screaming from the captives to warn the warriors of the tribes or without any traces of war against the tribes. Not everyone will be afraid to fight for their lives when the time arises, and not everyone will be willing to work with strangers in favor of being acceptable to their foreign policies, rules, and regulations. Godfrey, real quick, you know, as a, uh, full Nigerian. Have you ever heard any like ethnic stories, like Nigerian stories about people getting robbed by white people? Like, 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 I mean, <laughs> stolen and brought across to another land. Like, like, do you, have you ever heard an oral tradition? Like, don't go out into the, you know, by the river at night because you can get jumped by the white man and he'll bring you on a boat across the water. I never heard any of that. All I heard, like my father would tell me stories, just Nigerian proverbs and stuff that it relate to just Africa. Right, but then, so so there was never any proverbs or anything that related to, because like, if there were millions, right? Right. Millions of black people that were so-called taken away from their people, right? Now, as wise as we are with proverbs, right? Like we tell yeah. proverbs to, to, to teach lessons, and shit, right? So wouldn't you want to teach a lesson so that your people would not be stolen and shit like that? You see what I'm saying? Wouldn't right, of course, hell yeah. Some, some sort of African proverb that dealt with um, not Man. getting kidnapped by the white Man. man. Right because he'll take you over there on a boat or something like that. Or, or like this, what story are you familiar with that you were told? And I don't even like to consider you guys Africans because that's a misnomer. 
You know what I mean? You guys will call yourselves by your native tribe. And there's no problem with that. Actually, that's even better. You don't go to Africa and say, hey, I'm African. <laughs> Straight up. No. That don't happen. But hold no. on, let me, let me go back to what I was saying. Have you heard of a story, any, pick one, any story of a war that took place where some of your kinfolk was captured and brought over to another landman? No. After the 1800s, slavery was codified and institutionalized through various laws and regulations. These laws denied enslaved individuals fundamental human rights and established a brutal system of labor exploitation and land grabbing. Slavery played a pivotal role in the economic development of the United States, where large-scale plantation agriculture relied heavily on indentured servants, nowadays referred to as contracted employees, and the institution was seen as essential to the overall prosperity of the United States. Slavery also had a profound and enduring impact on American culture and society. It contributed to the development of racial hierarchies and deeply entrenched racial prejudices that continue to affect the United States today. It also shaped the cultural expressions and contributions of the indigenous people of America who are still being misclassified as Black Americans or African Americans. The American Civil War, which lasted from 1861 to 1865, is considered a significant turning point in the history of slavery. It is said that the debate over slavery in part drove the conflict and the Emancipation Proclamation issued by President Abraham Lincoln in 1863 declared enslaved individuals to be released from their duties of servitude. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, ratified in 1865, was said to have officially abolished slavery throughout the country, and following the Civil War, a period known as Reconstruction aimed to provide civil rights and opportunities for formerly enslaved individuals. However, this was followed by the Jim Crow era, characterized by racial segregation and discrimination, which persisted for much of the 20th century. The struggle for civil rights and racial equality in the United States has been ongoing since the alleged abolition of slavery. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s was said to have sought to dismantle segregation and secure equal rights for so-called Black Americans or African Americans, making another important chapter in the fight against racial injustice. So now, what do people think about when the term slavery becomes a topic? The thoughts and associations that come to mind can vary depending on an individual's background, perspective, and the context of the discussion because people often think about a range of historical and social and moral issues. The topic also raises awareness about the importance of education and historical understanding. Many believe that acknowledging and understanding the history of slavery is essential for addressing its legacy in promoting social justice. Some people think about the cultural contributions of enslaved individuals and their descendants. These contributions could be music, art, literature, and other forms of cultural expression, like various English dialects, foods, and clothing. Still, many people immediately think of the historical injustice of slavery, particularly in the context of the slave trade and the enslavement of so-called Black Americans or African Americans in the United States. So now, what will people see on search engine results when they search the term slavery? Well, we know how search engines like Bing, DuckDuckGo, and Google, for example, will provide various results because it's based on their machine learning algorithms 
and the individual user will encounter different results due to their current search history and direct geographical locations recorded by those algorithms. So we can determine that the search engine results on the term slavery vary. However, common types of results would often be links to news articles, books, and videos, a few politically driven organizations and their websites, and even some essays written by universities and other historical institutions. And let's not forget about the highly unreliable but typically encountered website called Wikipedia, which displays its articles written by anonymous writers of the world, mainly providing their opinions and some facts about subjects often searched by the public. But the majority of this website's sources listed underneath their articles of information are often unreliable, ranging from broken links of random websites to other articles archived from the internet. In 2001, Larry Sanger co-founded Wikipedia. He left the country company some years ago, but in the years since, Wikipedia has gone on to become the world's single most important source of history, of information about the world. And so it's a problem that we ought to pay attention to when Larry Sanger himself says that Wikipedia is no longer a reliable source of honest information. This is one of those things that a lot of people, a lot of us who use Wikipedia have noticed, well, wait a second, you know, I know some facts that are somehow not in this entry, or they're playing up something that doesn't seem to be true, or this is highly politicized. You see the bigger picture here. What do you think is going on? Well, it's complicated. Um, for one thing, Wikipedia allows anonymous contribution. And um, that means that uh, because it's one of the most uh, popular sources of information online, there's a natural um, incentive for uh, governments and corporations, spies, even criminal operations to uh, basically learn how to play the Wikipedia game. So it's, it's opaque to me now how it really works. And what results is um, basically establishment views are the ones that you find pushed, yes. and they have a, they've uh, completely abandoned the neutral point of view. That's a problem because, I, in my view, Wikipedia shapes this country's understanding of the world. It is the primary source of information for a lot of people, I would probably say most people actually, about history. So we need to fix this. How do you think that we would do that? Well, um, thanks for asking that. Uh, I don't know that there is a way to fix Wikipedia within Wikipedia. It must kill you as one of the people who founded Wikipedia, which has become this, this central part of our, of our culture, of our intellectual life, where does it is to say, to watch what's happened to it. How do you feel about that? I, I'm sorry, how do I feel about what? Your role in creating this thing that misleads ah. the country. <laughs> I'm embarrassed, to be quite honest, and I've said so for a long time. Um, I, I've been a, a leading critic of, of Wikipedia for over a decade now, and um, I've been trying various things to, to try to improve on it. And I'm sorry to all the people whose reputations have been sullied by, um, by what I, I got started 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, Google has helped a lot by promoting Wikipedia, which it, it assiduously does. Larry Sanger, I appreciate your coming on tonight. But to help users better understand the historical context of slavery, search engine results provide illustrations, photographs, and artwork depicting the alleged experiences of people enslaved in America. It's important to note that all search engine results when searching the term slavery would only associate their images with so-called black Americans or African Americans as being the enslaved people of America. Even though we know that slavery in America was one of the largest profitable businesses ever. This means that if that were the case, then slavery would have no set skin complexion and all people residing in America will be affected by it. 
This brings us to my next point. What people don't see within these search engine results concerning slavery in America, or even in their minds about slavery in general, would be images of white enslaved people in America. In America. In America. In America. These images can change one's perspective about slavery in America because they naturally have questions about something unfamiliar. After all, this critical portion of the stories is hidden away from public relevance. This will lead individuals to question the credibility of the sources and the accuracy of the stories about slavery in America. It could also influence individuals to question everything about their realities, considering that this portion of America's history is not prominent in their minds. Was this part of America's history purposely hidden from the public, be it school curriculums, books, movies, and other correlating resources that regurgitate this information? Why do you think this portion of slavery in America was hidden and not promoted as part of American history? Should we continue to allow all of these sources to regurgitate the same inaccurate tales as if so-called black people were the only enslaved people in America? Did you know that in the early 1900s, a treaty existed called the suppression of the white slave trade? Yeah, this treaty was established to garner the official permission of all governments of countries worldwide to agree to prevent the slave trading of white people. The list of arranging parties was not complete until 50 years later on March 21st, 1950, coincidentally right before the politically driven desegregation process of America, the civil rights movement, and the black power movement, and at a time when young so-called black college students were manipulated into believing that becoming electors or voters would somehow allow for themselves and their families to become first-class citizens of America. And that never happened, by the way. But how convenient is that? I'm just here to make you think. Slow dance. Yeah.